May I invite uh, everyone to be seated and we'll uh, begin this meeting of the Bicameral Climate Change Task Force. Um, my co-chair, Henry Waxman, is on his way, but I gather that uh, cherry blossom watchers <laughs> have slowed travel to the capital, and so um, his staff have told me that I can go ahead and he'll be joining us uh, as soon as he can. I want to recognize and thank my colleague Chris Murphy, uh, who is here as well, Senator from Connecticut, and uh, Representative Scott Peters has joined us as well from San Diego. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Um, this is uh, exciting. We have been doing a considerable number of briefings in a variety of areas. Uh, some very memorable, like uh, bringing in the firefighters who had been involved in the Western wildfires and um, hearing about the dramatic changes in the fire season and the fire intensity that have happened recently as a result of climate change. Um, but I don't think that there's been a meeting that we've had that potentially is more significant than this one. And the reason that I say that is that I believe we are far closer to a significant piece of climate legislation than most people anticipate. Um, my theory is that the President's regulation of existing power plants, which will be announced in June, is going to be a game changer for the industry not only in terms of its emissions once the regulation goes into effect, but in terms of its attitude, because it will no longer be free to pollute with carbon. And up against the requirements of the regulation, a carbon fee that is economy-wide may actually begin to look like a pretty sensible deal. <clears throat> and if the big emitters change their point of view, there will be a dramatic shift in point of view in Washington that will follow in the same instant. Uh, the second thing is that this gets into politics and beyond the scope of what we can legislate, but I do think that um, there's going to be a lot of energy around this issue in the coming congressional elections. And when you look at the numbers, uh, the polling about climate denial, it is disastrously bad for the deniers to the point where even young self-identified Republican voters by a majority identify climate deniers as, I quote, ignorant, out of touch, or crazy, in a check-the-box list of adjectives that uh, they were offered. Um, that's a pretty telling uh, problem and clearly shows that the denial castle is built on sand and that the sand is eroding fast. The third piece, I think, is that the corporate community, um, which in massive number has good policies and has good approaches to climate change, I think uh, can be successfully asked to take one further step and make it clearer to the American public where they stand. And if it's clear to the American public that the companies gathered here and com other companies, we've been in touch with a great number of them, Coke and Pepsi, UPS and FedEx, GM and Ford, Google and Apple, Walmart. Um, if there's a combined message coming from the regular corporate community, the adults in the room, I think that can swamp the denial message that is coming from a very, very small sector of polluters but is now dominating the debate and um, making the corporate world look as if that is its position. I think you put those three things together and you have the type of political paradigm shift that can make it very possible to pass the type of carbon legislation that many non-elected Republicans who don't have to face polluter money in primaries already support, and that many of our colleagues in the Senate already have supported, or at least did until Citizens United squelched the debate on this issue. So I think we're at a time of real promise 
And I am very grateful to the corporate leadership who have joined us today, not only for joining us today, but for their participation in BICEP and series and other corporate um, expressions of concern and solidarity about doing something sensible on climate change. So with that, let me uh, go from house to house for starters, and, and I'll turn to Representative Peters if he wants to make a quick opening remark before we get underway, then Senator Murphy, then Representative Christensen, who I welcome and came during my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'll just say um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm from uh, I'm a freshman representative from San Diego, California. I was uh, involved in a lot of um, local activities on climate. We used to say we weren't waiting for Congress to solve our problems. Um, I'm glad to hear some optimism from you that we might actually make some progress here. But uh, California's provided a lot of leadership and a great context with AB 32. Uh, we have a, a uh, act called um, SB 375 that forced local governments to plan for carbon emissions as they grew. Uh, and we were involved in a number of philanthropic efforts to provide, pr try to provide good philanthropic support for local decision making around climate, where in an area where we would be faced with uh, sea level rise um, challenges, uh, challenges from water supply, which we're seeing already, uh, and more intense wildfires. So um, I'm interested in the discussion and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Sheldon. Um, thank you for convening us here. This is really exciting to have this uh, turnout here today, and I'm glad to be here with you. Um, you know, I, I'm really eager to hear from the corporate partners who are here today um, to talk about what you've done and the opportunity from a business perspective that lies in being on the forefront of tackling the issue of sustainability. Um, I've worked a lot, uh, as frankly Scott has, in the House over the last year on um, trying to uh, present some new U.S. leadership on the issue of non-carbon dioxide uh, global pollutants, uh, and those are things like HFCs and methane. Um, and when you look at the path forward on those issues, you see enormous opportunity for U.S. companies as we convert away from polluting HFCs to a cleaner source uh, that comes out of things like refrigerant, uh, refrigeration units and air conditioners. It'll be U.S. companies that make that substitute and are able to sell it to the world as we cut down on the leakage of methane from gas and oil pipelines all across the United States and the world. It'll be U.S. pipeline technology companies that will make those new devices. It'll be U.S. gas and oil companies that will save money when they don't lose as much product as they transmit it uh, through the process. Uh, and so there is enormous opportunity uh, for uh, the U.S. business community in taking this leadership role. And I think, as Sheldon said, there is growing interest here in the United States Senate in acting, in part because we've seen the leadership mantle that the people around this table have taken. Uh, for instance, uh, we are on the verge, I am on the verge of introducing a rare bipartisan piece of legislation tackling the issue of climate change uh, around a U.S. leadership position uh, on non-carbon dioxide uh, pollutants. And uh, I think the reason that we're in that position to do something in a bipartisan way in the Senate, which is tough to do these days, is in part um, because of the stories that are going to be told here today. So uh, I'm glad to uh, stand on uh, Sheldon's coattails uh, and his great work on the Bipartisan Climate Task Force. Look forward to the testimony today. Representative Christensen, and we're joined by my co-chair, Henry Waxman. So after that, a few words, and then we'll get to the witnesses. Well, thank right. you very much. I'm delighted that we're having this. Representative Christensen, go. Um, I'll be very brief with okay. um, <laughs> thank you thank you to our very to our two co-chairs for convening it convening this and for the um, corporations that are here with us yesterday we met with the um, EU commissioner for climate action and um, one of the things that I guess her main message here in the United States was that this country needs to lead and um, I think if we're going to lead, it'll be because uh, our corporate um, partners will lead us to finally, in Congress, making the de decision to, to take some uh, meaningful action. So I'm just glad to be here, and, and thank you for thank you. joining us. Henry, my friend. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad that uh, we're all here today, and I appreciate the, uh, the panelists for uh, being with us. Uh, we're looking at uh, hearing from forward-looking, forward-thinking businesses that are helping lead uh, on climate change. Uh, for those of us who have been working on this issue, 
our model legislation in 2009 was based on a product that came from American business. Uh, many people didn't realize that we had support from the electric utilities, the uh, clinical, the chemical companies, venture capital, manufacturers, consumer goods, real estate, and even the oil, some oil companies. Uh, partisanship derailed our efforts in 2009. Our job now is to rebuild a diverse coalition for a renewed effort. There's no debate on the science. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change makes clear that climate change is happening, it's caused by humans, and will impact all regions and all countries. Leading companies, such as the ones that are here with us today, accept the scientific reality and are finding ways to reduce carbon pollution and grow their businesses at the same time. Uh, I think it's important that we hear from you. We've got to move forward. We can't accept the idea that uh, in the Congress of the United States, we're going to put our head in the sand, ignore the science, and refuse to act uh, on, I think, the biggest threat that's facing our world today. So I apologize for all of, to all of you because I'm late, but I'm uh, not too late to hear from you and for all of us to uh, learn from your experiences. I forewarned you, uh, Letitia Webster that I would start with her and VF Corporation, and I think just go right around if that's all right. I know that I got a note afterwards saying otherwise, so I'll take the bus. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us. This is actually a real treat to be here, so I appreciate the time you're taking to listen to us and absolutely the time you're taking to actually push real climate change uh, legislation and change forward in Congress. So it's very meaningful to us and, most importantly, to our consumers. VF is about a $12 billion corporation. Uh, we're based in North Carolina. Um, Two-thirds of our business is based on the outdoor lifestyle brands like Timberland, North Face, Nautica, Vans, Reef, um, many of them are new millennials, and they care deeply about sustainability. They tell us this day in, day out. We think about sustainability in terms of how do we reduce our risk to shareholder value, how do we reduce costs, and how do we create competitive advantage. And we think actually being sustainable actually is that lens, and it's incredibly important that we move the company in sustainable ways. Um, reducing our carbon footprint is probably the most important way of doing that. When we survey our consumers and our customers, climate change is the top topic um, and top concern for those consumers. Um, one thing that we talk a lot about is the kind of the major impacts that we're seeing with our business, and I'll just speak to a couple of them. One is actually around our supply chain. We're one of the largest uh, procurers of cotton around the world, and actually one of the largest procurers of North America, U.S.-based cotton. We've seen time and time again the fluctuations that climate change can actually have with cotton, with increased droughts, increased flooding, um, just very unpredictable weather patterns. That actually costs um, and changes the cost of cotton that was really difficult to plan our business against. Uh, we've seen major pr price fluctuations. Um, that actually, at the end of the day, hurts our margins, hurts shareholder value, and that's what gets the attention of our board and our investors. The second um, big thing is Again, around our brands, um, we are based on lifestyle brands. Um, we have many of our consumers, our athletes, um, our employees are out seeing the climate change impacts firsthand. Um, they are on Everest. They see the Kumbu ice fall quickly uh, dissipating. Uh, they see their snowfall quickly dissipating. We have people here from Burton and from Aspen as well who are absolutely impacted by shorter skier days. That's less product that we actually sell, and that's, again, raising um, awareness around our consumers and customers. Um, that is a risk, definitely, to our business. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, what we're really looking for is predictability. Um, we're also looking for um, some assurance from government globally, as well as nationally and locally, that this is an issue, and we're actually going to start putting some caps on some of our carbon, um, and we actually can then understand what the price is going to be, and we can plan our business appropriately. We also are tasked quite a bit with how do we move from a carbon-intensive um, energy source to renewable. Renewables right now are difficult. Um, we look at the ROI. It's often five, six, seven-year ROI. That doesn't necessarily bode well with uh, our CFO and finance committee, um, and I think if it gave even playing field for renewables, opening up a free market, so actually renewables can play. Um, and let the best product, the best innovation, the best technology win. That's what we're all about. And so I think any legislation um, to promote that, like the MLP, is actually a good thing for, for VF and our consumers. So um, thank you 
you know, for uh, for being here and uh, listening to us. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Senator Whitehouse, Congressman. Uh, Thank you for what, many hours on the set. The extra parts. We now have an assembly service, so you can probably work for us and help us on, on that. So, no, but Senator Whitehouse, uh, Congressman Waxman, task force members, uh, members of Congress, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak before you today uh, on this first anniversary of the Climate Declaration. My name is Rob Olson. I'm uh, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for IKEA in the U.S. And IKEA signed the Climate Declaration uh, one year ago because we believe it's our responsibility to have a positive impact on people and the planet. And that includes helping to tackle climate change by accelerating the de development of the low-carbon low economy. From talking to our customers, we know that Americans are increasingly concerned about climate change as they experience events like Hurricane Sandy and the drought in California. They want to reduce the amount of energy they use in their home, and they care about uh, reducing waste as well as using less water. This is why we are committing to make sustainable, affordable, sustainability affordable with a range of products to help our customers save energy and money. And it's why we are becoming the first U.S. home furnishings retailer to sell only LED bulbs and lamps. Think of the impact we can have if all of us just change uh, in a little bit in our daily lives. IKEA also is committed to running our business in a way that makes a positive impact for people on the planet. We have decided to become energy independent, and we will do this by using energy as efficiently as possible and by investing in our own supply of renewable energy. By 2020, our global goal is to generate as much renewable energy as the total energy we consume. To achieve this, we have invested significantly in solar, wind, and geothermal sources. We've installed 550,000 solar panels around the world. Right here in the U.S., we have solar installations on 90% of our IKEA locations in 20 states. I invite you to visit all of our IKEA stores in your home states and districts, and we'd be happy to show you how we're making a positive impact. America is rich in renewable resources. In addition to solar, IKEA also uses geothermal energy in the heating and cooling system at our store in Centennial, Colorado. And we have another geothermal project underway as part of our uh, new Kansas City area store slated to open this fall. I'm excited about that. Yes. <laughs> and we welcome you on grand opening day. <laughs> Today I'm proud to announce that IKEA is making its first wind farm investment in the United States in Hoopston, Illinois. This is the largest single IKEA renewable energy investment to date. Once uh, completed early next year, Hoopston Wind will have an installed capacity of 98 megawatts. The 49 turbine wind farm will generate the equivalent of 130% of our energy use in the United States and 10% of our energy use around the world. It's certainly a big deal for us and a big step toward reaching a 100% renewable energy goal by 2020. America has great opportunities for renewable energy, and with the investment, IKEA has more committed renewable capacity in the United States than in any other country. IKEA today produces renewable energy that is more than a third of the total energy we use worldwide, and we have committed to invest uh, $2 billion through 2015 to get closer to our 100% goal. We've now committed to own 206 uh, wind turbines worldwide and have wind farm investments in nine countries, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Poland, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and now here in the United States. Once all these projects are built, it will bring us to around two-thirds of our total energy use. In addition, our sustainability strategy includes ambitious goals to become more energy and carbon efficient in our business, as well as in our supply chain, and also to inspire and enable millions of people to live more, a more sustainable life at home. IKEA is proud to be a signatory of the Climate Declaration, an important call to action by businesses to address the imperative of climate change. People want to take action and are looking to business and government to play their parts. Tackling climate change will unlock business innovation and investment, and we should embrace this challenge together. At IKEA, we look forward to working with business partners and elected officials to continue the transition to a low-carbon economy. Together, we can accomplish much more and lead our way into a sustainable future. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Kevin Rabinovich from Mars. Thanks. I think I, uh, I drew the short straw following Rob and 98 <laughs> megawatts of uh, new wind capacity. Good morning, Senator Whitehouse, Representative Waxman, um, distinguished members of the panel, guests, other speakers. 
Um, thank you for holding this, this important briefing. Your, your leadership on climate change uh, and providing us the opportunity to address this group and, and share part of the story of Mars Incorporated. We're here today to share our view that, that science-driven climate action and business can go hand in hand. Uh, we're a private, family-owned business with over $33 billion in sales, more than 72,000 associates and operations in 74 countries. Here in the U.S. alone, we operate 38 factories uh, in 19 states and employ 25,000 of those associates. We're led by our five principles, and as a privately owned company, we have the benefit of being able to take a generational view, committing to the long term and making choices today that will pay off down the road rather than just this quarter. But through a focus on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, we're uncovering opportunities that make good business sense today and for the future. As an agriculturally based food business, we ground our decisions in science, whether that's plant science and agronomy for our raw materials or engineering in our factories. We're taking that same approach to thinking about sustainability at large and climate change specifically. We've accepted the scientific consensus that, that human-driven greenhouse gas emissions are leading to climate impacts. You know, we don't want to be, to, to quote Senator Whitehouse, ignorant or out of touch. Um, <laughs> our understanding of that science is that an emissions reduction of something like 80% by 2050 is, is needed to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Those consequences, as you well know, include altered temperatures and rainfall patterns, leading to floods, drought, spreads of pests and diseases, putting populations, communities, and habitats at risk. As a company whose supply chain is based on cocoa, rice, corn, peanuts, and other key agricultural commodities, this has serious implications for the supply of our raw materials, the farmers who produce them, and the surrounding communities all over the world. From our perspective at Mars, that leaves two options. Get to work on science-based reduction goals, or get to work planning for the consequences of climate change, or both. Uh, we took that challenge to our thinking about the supply chain, starting with our own operations. Realizing those would be easier to tackle than the rest of our supply chain, we started with an even more ambitious target than the science calls for, and have set a goal of 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2040, with a milestone of 25% by 2015. This is part of our overall sustainable intergeneration program for our operations, which also includes targets on fossil fuel energy, water, and waste. Facing into that challenge caused us to examine our energy use and sources in ways that we never had. And what we discovered there was uncaptured value, business value, in our operations. The first value came from efficiency. Energy isn't a big part of our cost structure, and there were good business projects, either unexecuted or even unidentified, because they hadn't been given priority. There were best practices at individual sites that hadn't been spread across our network. And just as important as the financial returns, the direct financial returns, there was an opportunity to engage the technical experts in our factories in our larger sustainability program, making them even more proud of being Mars Associates and helping us attract the next generation of associates. The second source of value comes from being a manufacturing business with factories that operate for decades like the new $270 million chocolate facility we just opened in Topeka, Kansas. We know those factories will need energy over those decades and discovered that by giving up a small amount of flexibility on future energy sourcing by considering long-term contracts, we could attract renewable energy developers to create projects that both green our energy supply and save us money. In summary, we've used the challenge of climate change and the science behind it to help us identify financially viable business actions and strategies we believe others can replicate. More importantly, if other companies and governments don't adopt similar science-based targets, our efforts will have limited effect on climate change. We cannot do it alone. We need the help and assistance of a variety of stakeholders, such as governments, other businesses, farmers, the scientific community, NGOs, and other stakeholders, the list goes on, um, to, to play their part in driving for real and science-based targets and solutions. More specifically, considering the limited progress by governments to address this problem in a systematic and meaningful way, Mars has joined with other like-minded global companies through BICEP to make the business case for addressing climate change and calling on governments to undertake meaningful negotiations to reach international consensus in a unified approach. In closing, we look forward to the day when having greenhouse gas reduction targets based on science is no longer a point of differentiation for Mars. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, Kansas is the big winner today. <laughs> I've never really noticed, which is phenomenal. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more, I think, from my heart. 
in terms of what it means for Sprint and what our evolution has been in understanding sustainability and the business value. And I'm also going to speak a little bit more broadly about corporate responsibility, because that is the scope that I look at. So I am Director of Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability at Sprint. I've been doing this for about eight years. Sprint has about 40,000 employees. We have about $40 billion a year in revenue, and we're almost exclusively domestic. So very much a U.S. business. We also don't have as clear of a case for why would Sprint be involved in climate change or the sustainability issues. We aren't an agricultural company. We have about $300 million a year in energy expense, but that's less than 2% of my operating expenses. It's not a huge driver for us. So it's been interesting to think about, well, why, why do we care about sustainability? And I think the beginning was more about reputation. I think we, we saw where the trend was going, companies were involved in it, and it seemed like the, a really important thing to do. And we saw that reputational lift. We saw a benefit actually in our connections in Washington, D.C. When it was important to the administration, that was a nice connection for us. What really changed for us is when our CEO came in, Dan Hesse, who has a really personal commitment to sustainability. And what he asked us to do when he came in was make those real objectives, make some specific goals that we could work against. So while we can't do 100%, we have a 20% greenhouse gas reduction goal, a 20% absolute energy reduction goal, and a 10% goal on renewable energy. That may not sound like a lot, but keep in mind, we've got about 60,000 cell sites. Can you imagine trying to make all of those solar or wind? We really, it's very difficult to do when you have such distributed, really small facilities. And most of our, our operations, it's in our network, a lot of capital in our network. But it looks like we're going to fully achieve our greenhouse goal this year, so three years early, very close on the energy goal, so we are achieving what we need to achieve. But let me, let me talk about why sustainability is good, good business for Sprint. So what we really are realizing now is the cost benefit. So if you look at that 20% reduction in energy use, that's about $80 million a year in real cost. If you look at our phone recycling program, another one of our top priorities in sustainability, we actually save about a billion dollars a year in cost avoidance in that. Paper reduction, we've saved about $20 million a year. So when you start having those kind of numbers, it really connects and the company understands the financial value of sustainability. And that is important. I'm a, from a fairly conservative area of the country, a conservative state. You know, it's, it's, um, this is what really plays, if you will, in the C-suite. Now we're starting a new paradigm, and we're really looking at value creation. So once you've achieved some of the reputation benefits, some of the cost reduction benefits, you begin to see that there's much more opportunity. So what we're really going for is that this shared value concept. How do we start innovating through sustainability, innovating with corporate responsibility, and creating value for society and value for our company? They, they fit together just beautifully. So I wish I had a whiteboard and a chart, but we've been, lately, this has been my big message. We met with our C-suite on Tuesday, and we really talked, and we gave them six examples of how we're going to help create revenue for the company in the next three years. So it's amazing, and, and I would say the whole company now is really, has a solid understanding of the business benefit. So as we look forward to the opportunity you've given us today, we want to help other companies become more sustainable. We want the government to help the companies become more sustainable. We think it will make businesses more profitable, businesses more competitive, and overall, um, a better country. So we are very excited to be participating in this, and we're looking forward to seeing the benefits. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, lastly, Colin Dyer. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Um, I'm Colin Dyer, and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Jones Lang LaSalle Incorporated. And thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to the task force. At JLL, <clears throat> we provide a comprehensive range of real estate services and investment management advice to our clients. We serve commercial, commercial real estate owners, um, occupiers, and investors with more than 50,000 professionals in 75 countries around the world. Um, one of our service areas focuses on sustainability, energy management, and green buildings as they relate to commercial property. We believe that we lead our industry in this field. In 2013, for example, we became the world's top employer of lead accredited professionals and green associates worldwide. It's clear that commercial real estate can have, does have an enormous impact on environmental sustainability. 
commercial buildings generate about 40% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the world's developed countries. So if you want to control greenhouse gases, you can't avoid buildings. We at JLL manage about 3 billion square feet of space globally for our clients. To visualize that, the Pentagon is about 6.7 million square feet, so we're managing 450 pentagons around the world. Um, Thank you for not using Rhode Island as a unit of measure. That's <laughs> perfectly fine. <laughs> I'll work that. I'll work on that. <laughs> so that size creates a significant opportunity for us as a business to major, make a major positive impact on sustainability in our clients' real estate portfolios. Last year, we helped clients reduce their collective greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 12 million metric tons. And in the process, we saved more than $2.5 billion of energy costs for them. As I noted above, the good news is that sound energy management strategies typically give our clients the single greatest opportunity to reduce both emissions and energy costs. This comes with no negative impact on their business operations. Cost savings alone create a compelling benefit of sustainable design, construction, and management. For example, we recently used our smart building management technology in a program to increase the building operating efficiency at Procter & Gamble. P&G earned back its initial investment in the technology in just three months and saw average energy cost savings of 10% annually. The program, which is being expanded, also improved building systems reliability supported the, cust the company's broader sustainability programs and actually increased employee productivity at the same time. So all good wins for the broader business agenda. Green, building, green buildings also create jobs. The US Green Building Council estimates that between 2009 and 2013, green construction activities generated nearly 8 million jobs in the US and nearly 400 billion in labor earnings. These are American jobs, and they will not be exported. When we managed the retrofit of New York's Empire State Building, for example, 200 new jobs were created for that project. Employers have also learned that sustainability is top of mind for the knowledge workers that they want to hire and re retain. Research indicates that as many as 90% of American workers want to work for a company with strong green credentials. Business interest in sustainable commercial real estate was originally driven by corporate occupiers such as my colleagues in the room today. In addition to their own desire to be environmentally responsible, they were challenged by employees, customers, and increasingly other stakeholders to become greener. More recently, and very encouragingly, real estate developers and investors have also identified benefits associated with sustainable buildings. In the US, for example, tax incentives can offset upfront development costs by between 30 and 50 percent. It took only two years for the 100 million Empire State Building renovation to which I referred to be paid to pay itself, to pay for itself. Owners are also anticipating and responding to the imposition of new environmental regulations, which we also welcome. In the US, this is currently limited to a few cities and states. We find that clients with large geographically diverse portfolios would prefer federal re regulation, one set of consistent rules for all of their portfolios. Building owners now find tenants more willing to pay a premium to lease space with su sustainable, in sustainable properties. Rents in buildings with Energy Star or LEED certifications are 2 to 3 percent higher than other buildings, and vacancies are typically much lower. Increased interest in sustainable real estate has also led to the development of green leases, which offer tenants and landlord meaningful, meaningful and quantitative and qualitative benefits. Both parties in these lease arrangements agree to a few critical commitments that will improve the environmental performance of leased space. Financial incentives ensure that each party benefits from adopting green lease measures. The potential for making commercial real estate more sustainable is immense. While much attention is given to new green buildings, for example, the opportunities are greater in existing properties. The average age of U.S. commercial buildings today is 53 year, years old. And in Washington, D.C., it's actually older at 70 years. And in a re recent study, less than 15% of building samples sampled were, were built in the last 10 years. So opportunities are bound to improve the greenhouse gas emission performance of older buildings. 
So I focus these remarks on opportunities which we've identified and acted on for our clients. I'd also like to close by observing how we try to practice what we preach. We've set three sustainability goals for JLL through to the end of 2017, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions in our own offices by 10% per employee, reducing our office energy use by 10% per employee, and reducing our occupied space by 8% per employee, all contributing to space use efficiency. Our progress and commitment have been validated by numerous awards and honors, including being named one of the world's most ethical companies for the last seven years. Sustainable business practice are a key requirement for earning that, aw that award. And in 2013, we received the EPA's Energy Star Sustained Excellence Award. But from my pers perspective, perhaps the most meaningful recognition comes from the fact that in our, in our latest global employee survey, over 75% of our people felt positive about our commitment to sustainability. Ultimately, for ourselves, for our clients, and for our clients, we at JLL believe that sustainability is good for business and simply the right thing to do. Thank you for your attention. Well, this is a very impressive uh, panel, and I know what you had to tell us is representative of, of other businesses, some of the major businesses in this country that have joined together with you in your determination to tackle this issue. Uh, so often here in Congress, we get the, the, the word that it's just too expensive. It's going to be too difficult. It, and because of that, people say, well, we can't tackle this problem. And they even go to the point of saying there is no problem. We just don't want to acknowledge it. So they look at the costs, they look at the burdens, and they are uh, uh, paralyzed by the enormity of the costs. But what you're telling us is that it's not just, not just looking at the wrong side of it. The other is the enormous business opportunity that is available if we start moving to a more sustainable future and uh, carbon uh, carbon reduction uh, future as well. Uh, I was impressed by your statement. You, you go to uh, start off because it's good for the reputation of the company. Then you realize that it's saving you a lot of money. And then it, in addition to that, the value of your businesses are in, increased because of your determination to uh, d live with this whole uh, issue and try to deal with it in a very productive way. So I, I, I'm very impressed by what you had to tell us. Uh, businesses don't just operate in a community anymore. It's very often around the world, um, whichever of you want to uh, tackle this. How, how, do you, how do you deal with the events that are taking place in different parts of the world, how climate ch change is affecting one area, maybe in a negative way, and other areas more positive ways? Uh, how do you... Uh, contemplate your investments and your activities uh, looking at the impact of climate change. Jova? Sure. Um, before Master? I answer that, I wanted to just touch on, on the cost thing. And I yeah. think um, one way to think about it is it's too expensive to not take action. I think we mm -hmm. haven't told enough of that story, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, you know, it looked like uh, FEMA spent over $130 billion over the past three years, about $450 per family, mm -hmm. just in their state of emergency and disaster relief efforts. That's real cost by not taking action, and it's just going to get worse. And so I think we need to flip it over and say if we start actually investing today, those dollars are productive. They actually can go to new technology. There could be the multiplier effect instead of just having to constantly rebuild and react from these storms and from the impacts of climate change. So I think that's just another part yeah, of that argument that we're not necessarily always considering. Um, for VF, we operate in about 150 different countries. We source our products in about 40 different countries, um, not just in, in Asia, but we source actually in the U.S. We manufacture in the U.S. We actually make um, TSA uniforms, the customs uniforms. Um, so we're, we're actually embedded quite a bit in the U.S. manufacturing, as well as in Latin America um, and actually around the world. We actually are very concerned about water scarcity. Textiles are one of the most intensive water um, uh, industries, um, not only from growing cotton, but also from the fiber 
production, um, synthetics, um, the dyeing, the finishing of that fiber. Um, we're very concerned that um, when you start looking at where droughts are happening, where floods are happening, where water risk is, where our businesses happen to be located there, many, much of our manufacturing is located there. Um, company or uh, countries could start looking at water and, and starting to divide it up. If there is droughts, I don't think textile industry is going to get a large portion of it. Um, it's obviously going to go to food. It's going to go for drinking water and communities. So it is a big issue. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that we're starting to map out, actually, is our supply chain, where we're sourcing our materials, and how is um, droughts and water scarcity impacting it. And I would also say communities. I would also say that um, looking at our brands um, and our consumer base, we've got Nautica, we have Reef, very invested in water communities. Um, they're very invested in communities that are out and about um, that are reliant on on healthy and productive um, you know oceans and water systems and they're seeing it firsthand and so how do we help them how do we help our consumers mm -hmm. actually think about this and help prepare them for it but um, I think really it's about it's about water and water scarcity I'll speak to the um, <clears throat> investment community but since we're corporate um, users of real estate here there's another perspective which is the people who build and own real estate, how do they view this problem? Um, I think increasingly in almost all developed countries ar around the world, so think Western Europe, US, Australia, uh, it is now high on investors' agenda. It wasn't 10 years ago, but it is now clearly on their agenda because they've understand, understood some of the points I made about the economics of sustainable buildings. Uh, they simply retain value. They are better uh, occupied, better leased for higher prices. So there's an immediate positive impact for them if they either build sustainable buildings or invest in uh, retrofitting energy sustaining um, measures. And the little known fact is that it's really uh, the tr traditional and classical technologies rather than solar panels and, green and, and wind farms has actually produced the fastest paybacks. So typically a wind farm is 10 years. Um, simply putting better ins insulation in buildings is two to three years of payback. So there's a very immediate case for 20 to 30 percent of energy savings from very low effort, better management, and low-level investments in real estate. The developing world is, is sadly way behind this agenda, sadly because they are actually building uh, currently their built environment. The work that we all did 100, 200 years ago, they are now doing it, but they're not putting a huge amount of attention at this stage into the efficiency of that real estate. They have obviously other priorities. Um, final point I'd make is that um, the reality of this is that um, investors and institution investors, we manage $50 billion of, of real estate around the world and <clears throat> investments we manage as fiduciaries for institutions and sovereign wealth funds and other organizations. Um, they are, uh, when they're making acquisitions of real estate now, they, are, they have a checklist of sustainability issues from um, the efficiency of buildings, the economic reasons for that I've referred to, but also is this building on a, fl a current floodplain or a future floodplain? And these are quite sobering things when you see those sorts of checklists on the sorts of things that people are now having to consider when they look forward 10 to 15 years. So a few pieces of information from the investor side of this equation. Mm -hmm. I think to uh, yeah. look at it from a retail perspective as well, or, or comp corporate perspective, there are many small actions you can do to uh, positively impact from the cost side. You alluded to quite a few, Amy, the two mm -hmm. actions that you guys have taken, where back in 2006, we removed plastic bags uh, from our locations. Helps on the cost side, but more importantly, helps on the environmental side, so you're able to take action. Removing incandescent bulbs in, in 2012 uh, from, from uh, sale. It's not uh, something that's going to impact our cost, but put us ahead of the competition and moving towards where the future will be. Now in 2016, moving to LED as well, 100%, uh, is that opportunity to be ahead of where the trends are going. But uh, from an investment standpoint, and how do you decide or how do you evaluate where to uh, uh, focus on renewable energy? Being a global company, we needed to focus on the totality and look around the world to see where can we have an impact? And uh, when we look at these type of investments, like the wind farm we just announced, we don't look at it as a two-year, three-year, five-year, eight-year. We look at 25 years to see how are we uh, going to uh, be able to model this uh, for the long term and really stand behind it and benefit our company uh, and be prepared for different uh, changes that will come to the climate over time. So it, it's really about uh, taking some small actions that you can do immediately, impacting your cost structure, 
and then looking to the long term and how do you prepare yourself for the future and companies need to be in the forefront of that and taking the action uh, today to prepare for tomorrow. If I could make an effort to, to stitch your two questions together, um, you know, in terms of our in terms of our agricultural uh, raw material supply, you know, one of the things we realize and, and see now, just as as Letitia commented on on cotton, is we see crops suffering impacts from from climate change, uh, and and obviously that that flows through to us in the form of price and in, in some extreme cases even availability at any price of of raw materials, um, and that obviously impacts us. That impacts our our consumers. So uh, building on sort of our science-based approach to things, you know, we, we came to the insight several years ago that a lot of the crops that we rely on uh, are ones that have not gotten the attention from sort of the agricultural science community that, that things like corn and, and soy and wheat have. Uh, so, so a few years ago, we sequenced and put into the, the public domain the, the genome of cocoa. Um, which has been uh, an incredibly powerful tool to, to help researchers all over the world develop higher yielding, more drought resistant, uh, more productive plants. And a, and a more productive uh, cocoa tree is good for us. It improves supply. It's good for the farmer because they now have more product to sell. Um, just recently, uh, we've been part of a group that's done the same for peanuts. So the peanut genome is now also out. And we're also part of something called the African Orphan Crops Consortium, which we help set up to, to sequence the genomes of a hundred uh, important food crops for Africa that are, you know, less um, less part of sort of the global agribusiness but are really important to, to you know, feeding, uh, feeding populations. And, um, you know, those are areas where we see there's science that exists that hasn't been applied to some of those areas and, and we've, we've found that, that we can play an important role in helping advance that to, to, to benefit our supply chain and the communities that we source from. I've got a couple easy comments, I guess. Um, again, I don't have all these same challenges that you have, but I can talk about some, to me, relatively simple things that, that companies need to do. Uh, one relates to the insurance industry. So as I think about our risk management plans, we rely on an insurance agency to help us identify our risks. So if I think about site by site, that's something that you consider your insurance company can help you drive and your climate impacts need to be considered in your risk management portfolio. So for us, what that means is site hardening. How do we make sure all of our infrastructure for the network is very protected so that when there is some sort of a climate impact, we can survive that and communications can continue. But that's built right into our site management plan for our sites. The other piece really is the supply chain opportunity. And you've given some, I mean, incredibly detailed examples. If I go at a, at a much simpler approach, you know, we have a requirement that our suppliers measure and try to manage their greenhouse gas emissions. It's been amazing to me that many of them didn't know how to do that. So we actually wrote a training manual this year for one, how do you identify what your material impacts are to the environment and to society? And number two, how do you measure your greenhouse gas emissions? And how do you do it without having to hire a consultant to do it? So I call it the CSR for Dummies book. <coughs> but it's been really useful. And how do you bring them along, help them understand it? And more importantly, how do I inspire them to see the business benefit? Not just do it because I'm asking them to do it. We want them to do it. In, authentically so that they can see the business benefit. So then you can start to make choices. This supplier has more risk than this one. I should go with this one. It's better for me in the long run and they haven't come along. So that, that's really how it starts affecting your business. Thank you very much. One of the um, joys of today's conversation is how forward-looking and successful you all are. And I think that you are broadly representative of America's business community in that posture. Um, and it's wonderful that you see the rewards that Kevin talked about. I think you said, when we faced into these goals, what we discovered there was uncaptured value. And um, I think that's a relatively common experience. And the problem that I have is that the face of the corporate community in our world, here in Washington, is totally at odds with those messages um, for reasons that escape my comprehension. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is probably the most active uh, lobbying organization for the business and corporate community, 
is in climate denial mode. They want to hear nothing about it. Um, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is often viewed as a voice of uh, America's corporate community, is in outright climate denial mode. Um, and the lobbying power that is brought to bear on Congress on this issue is very, very heavily by the deniers. And so, um, as I said in my opening comments, I think we are tantalizingly close to being able to get the kind of system-wide carbon fee that provides certainty, that provides a market correction, that provides uh, the best solution, according to economists all the way over from Reagan's economist, Arthur Laffer, uh, to more uh, progressive economists, and including the big Nobel Prize winning economist, Joe Stiglitz and uh, Paul Krugman. So there's an enormous body of work and good economic sense. There's an enormous uh, power in the corporate sector in this direction. What can we do to bring the place where America's corporate sector is to the attention of Washington, where, frankly, a very different point of view is being represented that I think is actually only really being effectively represented in Washington. I doubt that, you know, you can go very many places in the country and find the same corporate climate denial that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Wall Street Journal editorial page represent. They seem to be highly unrepresentative, and yet in our world it's very constraining. So how can we, how can you all help us break that and get this problem solved in a way that I think helps everyone? I know that BICEP and Sirius have been great organizing influences, and I think what you're all doing is terrific. But I think two things haven't happened. One, the corporate message hasn't sunk through. It's a murmur um, from many voices that are saying the same thing, but because it's not being said together, it doesn't come through clearly. It doesn't have to be said more loudly, I don't think. It doesn't have to be said more stridently or harshly, but I think it helps if it's said together and the message can come out of the murmur. And um, the second is that it may be time to begin thinking about putting the sustainability pressure and motivation that um, so much of the corporate community feels into its political activities a bit more. So we're, you know, agreeing we're just not going to support people who aren't reasonable about climate change any longer and making that position clear so they can see it coming. There are no surprises, but they know that that, that um, the days of safe denial are, are over. And I'm, I'm so frustrated because we're so close to being able to do this. And the opposition to it has so little credibility. And yet, it has this effect because we haven't been able to punch through. And Henry and I being more strident, I don't think helps. It's going to take a new voice coming in mm -hmm. to be the adults in the room and to say, enough. Climate change is real. We know it. And, and you should, too. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on those observations on how your world intersects with my political world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're spot on. I think there's a vocal minority out there that is definitely, I think, um, frustrated a lot of us. Um, to be honest, um, I can speak for, for VF and our brands. Um, we've been doing quite a bit, you know, around sustainability. We also have a lot of renewable energy, lead platinum buildings. Um, as well, lots of carbon reduction goals, all that kind of stuff. I think, frankly, we've been heads down, actually just getting it done. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you start looking about around, I guess, you know, again, return on investments, whether it's, you know, my time and my team's time or where we're going to invest our capital, we're going to invest our capital in actually making change and getting ahead and actually being competitive instead of trying to deny something that we know it's coming. It's just a matter of when it's coming. So we consider it as no regret actions. 
in terms of moving forward with sustainability. There's no, there's really no downside. Um, Excuse me, I'm going to excuse yeah. myself because I just got a note. There's a meeting that I, oh. that where they're voting on some oh. telecommunications issues oh. that have to go to. Uh oh. Uh oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> and, Amy, it's your fault. Wants me <laughs> <there>. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. I guess, I guess you, you hit on something as I was thinking about, you know, where is that points of leverage that you guys need help with and that we can actually think about working with BICEP and series on? And, you know, it's the Chamber of Commerce, which. Yeah, you know, I think it would be you know really interesting to see how we can influence them, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I, we need to understand, at least I need to understand, what you specifically need. What are those points of communication that's really going to change things? Now we're meeting with a number of people here today, um, that I think will help. But what is it that you guys really, really need? And I heard two strong things: the Chamber and Wall Street Journal. So maybe that's something we take back to the group and say, how can we, you know, raise our voices up? Um, so, you know, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd add the two other things that I mentioned. One would be to make the murmur into a message mm -hmm. by having some kind of a more consistent public expression of where you all are um, and where so many other corporate leaders are. I mean, I'd love to see the CEOs of Coke and Pepsi on the screen saying, you know, we compete like crazy with each other, but one thing we agree on, climate change is real, we know it, and you should too. Mm -hmm. And pff, done, public service announcement, go on. Then have UPS and FedEx yeah. get up and do that. Then have Ford and GM get up and do that. Then have Google and Apple get up and do that. And they're all engaged. They're all engaged. All Everybody's in the right place already. But as I said, all the voices together create a murmur, and they haven't created a message yet. And I think that hasn't punched through to the, to the public, and it hasn't enabled us to leverage off of that. And the second is that, you know, in home states and where you have the ability to, you know, direct um, your politics, okay. lift this as a measure and say, look, we're just, we just can't support people who are denying this stuff any longer. So I wanted to jump in with just one, one quick thought on this, though, as a person from a conservative state with a fairly conservative company. So we've tried to change the dialogue a little bit away from the climate issue because there's got so much baggage on it. Instead, just talk about the business benefits. So when we go into an executive meeting, I, I never say climate change. It's written. We talk about it in our written things, but that's not the business proposition internally. How does this make our business better? And they can relate to that. Yeah. And so that's been at least very effective from our approach. I'm not going to force them, if you will, to lose face. I'd rather just say, let me give you a, a graceful way out by talking about the benefits to business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that fully supports the activities that you are undertaking, which are immensely commendable and, you know, terrific and exactly the right thing. But it doesn't support the next step, which is how do you break through yes. this little ring of of uh, denial that a very small subsector of the corporate community has erected around Washington, D.C., very inconsistently with the views and experience of the great majority of the corporate community. So that's, it's that next step that I'm, I'm uh, thinking about. I think the approach is twofold. I mean, it's first to continue with venues like we have here today, coming together as corporations and seeing how we can support and what actions we can learn from each other to move forward. But more importantly, it's just to continue our own actions. And, and as we move forward and uh, invest in wind farms or, or solar uh, panels, geothermal, et cetera, continue to do that and more people will see and learn from what's happening and realize that it's good business, yeah. that, it, that sustainability is our business and we all are responsible for it moving forward in a good way. So the, the best way we can convince is to continue to act in a strong way. I also know that the um, business community puts a strong premium on results, um, things that are sort of just done as time wasters that don't produce a result uh, usually aren't very long part of the agenda. Um, and I could see how the business community could look at where we are in Washington and think, well, you know, we can go down there and talk at them till we're blue in the face, but it's hopeless. And therefore, this falls into the we're not going to get a result mm -hmm. category. Um, I would like the chance to 
try to convince you that it's actually way closer than we think. I wouldn't be having this conversation with you if I didn't think that it would make the difference and it would make a sensible carbon bill deliverable in, say, 2015. That's my, you mentioned that setting goals made a difference. Mine is a carbon bill in 2015. I think it's achievable. Like many important things, it's only achievable with effort. But I can mentally think through the effort steps that will get us there. And like anybody else, I may be wrong, but my sense coming into this is that we are tantalizingly close. And the obstacle that separates us from this is, um, you know, it's time to pull back the curtain. There really is no wizard. There's mm -hmm. just a, a little group of companies that have put up a lot of nonsense, and it's time to just move right on. Mm -hmm. Well, why can't we get that conversation with those CEOs? Every one of those that you mentioned has spoken publicly on this subject. So is that out of reach? I no, mean, I don't our, think it is our, out of our reach. Our CEO would, would join in. I don't think it is out of reach. I think it's within reach, and I think it's the important sort of next step. I think that the, the, the three-step path to getting this done is, one, making sure that the existing plant rules change, because that mm -hmm. creates a dramatic change on the emitters' side in terms of their attitude and willingness to accept something like this. Right now, they're living in hog heaven of free carbon pollution, and that when that ends, a lot of things change. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second is my read that the politics of this is going to be different than folks suspect in the 2014, and there's going to be some real surprises for people, both in terms of the uh, amount and the success of political activity against carbon deniers. And the third would be to marshal the existing power and positions of the corporate leadership community and simply, again, I can't think of a better way to phrase it, have the, have the voice become not just a murmur of everybody saying the right thing, but having people actually say it together and in a way that it pushes into our public consciousness more. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the message has to change in any respect from what all of mm -hmm. your CEOs and you who are CEO uh, are saying and thinking. I just think it needs to be coordinated, put to music. So thank you so much. I am so impressed with um, what we've heard. It really gives me optimism. I know that um, it took a leap of faith to, uh, back to Mars's words, to face into those goals uh, before it became apparent that there was uncaptured value. and. Um, you guys are just really doing the right thing, and I'm, I'm honored to be with you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.